presenters, as well as our discussants um, or respondents. Uh, the um, main presenter for the IMF Regional Economic Outlook on Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, Abebe Selassie. He's the director of the IMF's African Department with responsibility for the fund's operation and engagement with the 45 member countries from Sub-Saharan Africa. He assumed this role in September 2016, having served as Deputy Director of the Department. Since 1994, Mr. Selassie has served in different capacities in the Funds Departments, from Resident Representative, Mission Chief and Division Chief. Before joining the Fund, he worked at the Economist Intelligence Unit in London and served the Government of Ethiopia. Uh, Abebe did his graduate studies at the London School of Economics. You are most welcome. Um, uh, after Abebe presents, uh, Yaroslo Wizorek uh, will uh, do a brief uh, follow-up presentation, uh, and I believe uh, he's uh, popularly referred to as Yarek, uh, and he's a Polish national and deputy division, division chief in the Regional Studies Division of the IMF's African Department and the Mission Chief for Burundi. Mr. Uh, Yarek holds a PhD and MA in, in International Economics from the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva and MA in Economics and MA in Philosophy from Warsaw University. He was also a George Soros Scholar at Lincoln College, Oxford. Before joining the African Department, Yarek worked in the Fund's Middle East and Central Asia Department and in Policy Development and Review Department. Prior to joining the IMF, Yarek held teaching positions at Warsaw University and the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva and worked as a consultant um, in Geneva as well. His research interests and areas of expertise include growth and trade economics, macroeconomic adjustments in crisis-stricken and post-conflict countries, and natural resource management. Those are the two presenters, and uh, as discussants to respond uh, to the presenters, uh, we have uh, uh, Ashok uh, Chakra 40, uh, Tracy Tarini, and uh, Jasmine Chipika. And I will just give you a brief bio data. Uh, Ashok is a development economist who has worked in Africa for 40 years, during which he worked for UNDP, OMTAD, USAID, uh, DFID, and other international agencies. He has also worked for, uh, as an advisor to many African governments. He holds several degrees from Delhi and Oxford universities and is the author of many academic papers and books on development and the economic performance of nations. From 2009 to 2014, he was senior visiting lecturer in the Department of Economics, University of Zimbabwe. During the same period, he has also worked as an advisor in the Ministry of Finance. Currently, he is a coach on the Ease of Doing Business program under the Office of the President and Cabinet, a program intended to improve uh, the enabling environment in agriculture, manufacturing, and the mining sector. Most welcome, Ashok. Uh, Tracy Tavini is the marketing executive for Dairy Board Zimbabwe Private Limited. From 2008 to 2016, she was managing director for Lion Zimbabwe, and prior to that, she worked as group marketing director Dairy Board Holdings Limited and was also business development executive at PG Industries Zimbabwe. From 1987 to 2003, she worked at the University of Zimbabwe in various capacities, uh, ranging from lecturer, head of department, and the executive team in the Faculty of Commerce. She serves on various boards and has won several accolades in marketing and entrepreneurship. She has an MBA from Pennsylvania State University and a Bachelor of Business Studies from the University of Zimbabwe. Most welcome, Tracy. And uh, Jasmine Tarisai Chipika is an economist with over 32 years experience. She holds a PhD in economics, MSc economics, and BSc economics, all from the University of Zimbabwe. She has been a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe for 15 years and has served UNDP as national, econo national economist and economic advisor. Recently, she was Senior Economic Development Consultant and Economic Advisor in Zimbabwe and Saddick region. Jasmine is currently, as we are all aware, the Deputy Governor of uh, the Central Bank and is a fighter for inclusive economic development and women's economic empowerment in the last four decades. So thank you all for, um, for making the time to present 
as well as to respond and to discuss uh, the paper. So what we will do is uh, we will ask uh, Mr. Selassie to present uh, on the different economic outlook for about uh, 20 minutes, uh, followed by um, Yarek will present on the output effects of fiscal consolidation for about 10 minutes. Then I will ask each of the discussants to uh, respond uh, for five minutes each. Then we will turn it over to the audience uh, to take uh, questions, comments uh, for about uh, 20 minutes or so. So without further ado, may I invite uh, you, Mrs. Selassie, to come and present the regional economy. It gives me a great pleasure to be here in, uh, in Harare. Uh, Zimbabwe. I have to say, uh, Zimbabwe's independence was one of the earliest political awakening moments for me while I was at school, and uh, so it really feels uh, great to finally uh, come here and see the place uh, in all its glory. Uh, so this morning, uh, I would uh, like to present how we at IMFC, uh, what we at IMFC have been the conductual picture of the economic uh, conditions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I, my presentation basically will be uh, three parts. Uh, first, I'll talk about what we see as being a recovery that is underway uh, in the region at the moment from the very difficult uh, uh, year, year and a half uh, that preceded uh, this year. Uh, second, I will talk about the factors that have been driving this recovery. And then third, and more importantly, in a forward-looking way, we'll, I, we'll talk about the, the policy uh, challenges and uh, requirements of this uh, juncture. So, the first part is, uh, the first point to make is uh, that uh, we are seeing a growth pickup in uh, the lion's share of countries in South Africa, Africa this year. Uh, this follows basically a collapse in growth last year to 1.4%. Uh, and this year, by contrast, we're expecting a pickup to around 2.6%. Uh, this pick, you know, uh, this pickup in activity to a large extent reflects uh, one of factors. Uh, most notably, uh, in Nigeria, uh, oil production has picked up. But also in uh, South Africa and uh, I mean, here in Zimbabwe also, we're seeing uh, in several other countries in the eastern uh, uh, seaboard of, uh, of uh, eastern and southern part of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, we see a pickup following the uh, uh, very damaging effects that drought had uh, last year. Uh, but overall, the key point I would like to stress is this is very much a glass half full picture because you know while growth is expected to pick up to even 3.5 percent next year and beyond, the momentum for growth remains weak and uh, growth at three and a half percent or so. Uh, in the next couple of years would remain well below the uh, 5% or more that the region was uh, expanding by uh, uh, in the years up to 2014. So a pickup relative to last year's outcome, which was the worst uh, growth performance in more than 20 years, but still uh, fairly anemic uh, growth rates uh, in prospect in the next couple of years. And I would like to stress that, you know, while you know, the growth outcome is better than last year, but this recovery remains very inadequate. Uh, a couple of statistics uh, on this point. Uh, first is that, you know, uh, in 12 countries, uh, per capita GDP growth this year will be negative. So, you know, in real terms, uh, incomes will not be improving for about 40% of the population uh, in the region. Uh, that's 400 million people. So. Uh, you know, while in uh, you know two thirds of the countries in the region there should be some in increase in living standards and capita income, uh, in uh, a significant share of the you know uh, number, significant number of people, significant number of people, a significant share of uh, the region's countries, there will still be a decline in the capita income both this year and next couple of years. So uh, it very much remains a glass half full picture, as like I said. Drilling down a little bit into the to the numbers, uh, you know, a big source of uh, recovery this year will be uh, the pickup in extreme oil, in the performance of oil exporters, which here in the presentation are represented by the red bars. Uh, we see that the very significant uh, decline in growth for those countries, uh, in most cases uh, collapsing into uh, recession uh, last year, following the decline in commodity prices and as countries struggle to adjust. 
And uh, very gradually, we're seeing a pickup in uh, economic activity um, in the region. Um, for the other country groups, the more diversified uh, exporters, the decline in growth has been a little bit less uh, pronounced. And those countries will continue to be maintaining growth uh, at uh, you know, fairly healthy rates of 4 or 5%. <coughs> This risk, however, is subject to significant uh, downside. Uh, this outlook is subject to significant downside risks uh, going forward. Uh, so, uh, most notably, of course, uh, is the failure to reform policies and address some of the policy challenges that uh, I will highlight in a minute it could lead to uh, you know, even lower growth outcomes. Also, to, you know, countries need to guard against the potential the adverse external environment this last year. The financing environment facing the region, as I'll discuss in a moment, has been favorable, but should financing conditions tighten, this also is a source of risk to that outlook. On the inflation front, last year, uh, for the first time in several years, we had seen an acceleration in uh, the level of inflation across a lion's share of countries in the region, particularly uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, reflecting uh, the, the rapid increase in food prices. We are seeing, uh, you know, the wake of better harvest, a decline in uh, food prices, uh, bringing down, uh, pulling with it overall inflation. Another driver of uh, higher inflation in the last couple of years has been exchange rates depreciation. Here too, we are seeing stabilization in exchange rates and uh, tightening of monetary policy, which is contributing to uh, to the decline in uh, beginning to you know, deceleration in inflation. No. One thing we, uh, we uh, macroeconomists are not really good at is explaining why uh, growth matters. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I wanted to show you a couple of charts on, you know, uh, and bring out why it is that we, what, why we uh, complain or, uh, you know, uh, highlight when growth is not doing well and uh, rejoice when growth is increasing. This chart shows basically the improvement in per capita income for Sub-Saharan Africa over the last um, 25 years, from 1990 and 2015. And what we've seen across the board in the region, uh, to vary in the case, but you know, the broad trend has been for one of significant increase in uh, per capita income uh, for most countries uh, in the region. And over time, we can see the, the implication of this being a very significant increase in living standards. But perhaps most, most importantly, uh, this growth tends to facilitate the improvement in very tangible uh, improvements in people's well-being. Here, uh, I show a couple of, of data points on improvements in human development outcomes. The first bar on the left shows the improvement in maternal mortality over the same period. And with growth, governments have more resources to invest. Uh, um, spend on health, education, uh, infrastructure, and you know this investment really uh, translates into very, very tangible improvements in uh, indicators like maternal mortality, infant mortality uh, has also uh, declined very significantly, uh, really in a very uh, impressive way. And of course, life expectancy more broadly in the region has also been um, improving. So uh, this growth matters not just for being able to, you know, in terms of. Uh, the, uh, the shiny buildings we see in, uh, in our capitals, it's really in a very fundamental way for the well-being of, uh, of people. And this is often uh, a relationship that's not uh, highlighted enough. So, uh, I want to discuss now a little bit uh, about the factors that have underpinned the recovery in, uh, in, uh, in economic outlook uh, this year. <coughs> First point, as I alluded to earlier, is that the financing conditions facing uh, the region, uh, particularly the frontier markets in the region, the countries that have been issuing euro bonds uh, in the last several years, has improved significantly over the last year. The chart on the left shows uh, the very sharp decline in the borrowing costs uh, that the region's frontier market countries have been uh, able to enjoy uh, basically since, uh, since uh, late last year. Uh, very significant compression of, uh, of uh, the borrowing costs. And accompanying this has been an increase in the issuance of uh, euro bonds by countries in the region. So last year, for example, we saw, um, we saw uh, only around $750 million being raised by uh, countries in the region. This year, uh, just in the first half, 
that's going to show us to the tune of around four and a half billion uh, dollars. Perhaps uh, the, the most notable uh, factor about, about this compression in, in, in yields has been that it reflects uh, largely external factors. Because on the ground, as I said, growth remains weak, and on the fiscal side, the uh, outcomes have been uh, weaker as reflected by rising debt. But despite this, external financial conditions uh, facing the region have improved, uh, particularly uh, for countries like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Senegal, who have all been able to issue bonds. Now, it is true that uh, there has been some improvement in, uh, in uh, the conduct of policies over the last couple of years. Here I show uh, the evolution of the exchange rates, uh, several exchange rates in uh, Nigeria. In the wake of the decline in uh, commodity prices, the initial policy response uh, was to delay the required uh, exchange rate adjustment. So the official rate moved in only gradually and in steps uh, to reflect the new economic reality of much less uh, foreign exchange inflows. In the meantime, uh, as uh, the amount of foreign exchange that was being made available uh, remained low, uh, the parallel market emerged for the first time in many years. And we saw very uh, large premium uh, as depicted here by the black line. But uh, gradually, the, the lines have started to converge as, uh, as uh, greater flexibility has been accommodated by uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. So it's part of the inflow and part of the favorable financing conditions we see reflects this improvement in policy outcomes. On the fiscal side also, uh, after deficits widened very significantly, uh, we've seen some stabilization of the uh, fiscal deficits, albeit at elevated levels. For analytical purposes here, we uh, unpack the fiscal uh, deficit in the region uh, into three broad groupings. The first group is uh, oil exporters on the left. In the middle, we have uh, what we call other resource intensive countries. So these are countries that do not export just oil, but also uh, but, uh, more varied uh, commodities. Uh, countries like Zambia, uh, uh, South Africa, or this category where you know, they have uh, the significant commodity exported, but uh, not of oil. And then we have the countries on the far right panel, uh, which are more diversified uh, export bases, uh, the likes of Kenya, uh, uh, Senegal, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And what we see in all three categories is fiscal deficits having widened uh, in a fairly pronounced way. Uh, and uh, thankfully, uh, as, of, uh, as of this year, we're seeing this uh, widening uh, plateauing. Current account prices, which you know, are driven partly by the fiscal outcome, but also the recovery exports, have uh, stabilized also. Uh, which is again uh, a sign of the uh, required uh, required adjustment that uh, needs to uh, proceed in the coming years. So, what are the policy challenges, and how can uh, how can countries uh, going forward go back to the very dynamic rates of growth that we were seeing we were seeing until uh, 2015 or so? We think there are three policy challenges at the moment. Uh, first one is uh, addressing what we see as emerging debt vulnerability. Uh, second is, you know, the way to do it, I think, in the lion's share of countries has to be through mobilizing revenues, and I'll explain why uh, adjustments should come on that side. And then third is uh, the need to, once again, uh, bring back to the table, uh, bring back to uh, uh, the front and center the need to diversify uh, the structure of our exports and economies more broadly. So, first, uh, the debt stocks in, uh, in uh, the region, uh, public debt stocks in the region, has been, have been increasing. Um, and this is true for all three uh, categories of countries that, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, so the increase in debt to GDP ratios have been most acute in oil exporting countries. But the other countries which have more or less been enjoying high growth rates, we've also seen a, a marked increase in uh, debt levels. So one of the first thing we did when we looked at this was to try and uh, look at what the factors driving the increase in uh, debt have been. 
in the oil exporting countries between 2015 and 16, there's been an eight specific points of GDP increase in debt each year, uh, as depicted by the black dots. And the main drivers of the increase uh, for oil exporting countries have been, of course, the collapse in, uh, in uh, GDP growth that those countries experienced in the wake of oil price decline, and the very large deficits that uh, these countries have started running up uh, in the last uh, several years, coupled with uh, exchange rate depreciations. So that has been a significant driver. But as I noted earlier, more recent has been uh, that we've seen debt going up, uh, probably to a modest degree, around 5 percentage points of GDP a year between 2013 and 2016, in the other countries which have sustained high rates of growth. In those countries also, we see uh, the fiscal deficits, uh, as depicted by the blue, the blue uh, bars, uh, having contributed to the increase in debt. Of course, because growth has been high in those countries, the, the red bars are negative, so offsetting, offsetting uh, the increase in debt coming from other factors. But another important driver has been uh, exchange rate depreciation in those cases, as well as uh, debts and uh, contingent liabilities that have been on the balance sheets of state-owned state -owned enterprises, which have migrated onto the general government's uh, balance sheet, uh, explaining this, uh, this increase in debt. The consequence of this increase in debt has, of course, been a very sharp increase in the debt servicing ratio, particularly for uh, oil exporting countries, accounting for around 25% of uh, tax revenues. But in the other uh, country groupings also, uh, we're seeing a significant uh, trending upwards of, uh, of uh, the interest uh, the interest payment uh, as a contribution of uh, total revenues. This, of course, is detrimental because uh, the, the increase in debt service costs is resources that would otherwise be used to invest in health, education, uh, investment in infrastructure. So, uh, you know, it, 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 mitigate, it mitigates uh, the kind of investment governments need to do to facilitate uh, growth in the coming years. And this fiscal pressure uh, also uh, had, is beginning to manifest itself on the balance sheet of the financial sector. We're seeing uh, uh, already uh, banks balance sheet will be affected by the slowdown in economic activity so that non-performing loan levels uh, in banks have been on the increase. Uh, and this is being, you know, more pressure still on bank balance sheet is being put on uh, because governments have been borrowing quite extensively from the financial sector. This chart basically shows the increase in non-performing loans, uh, mainly from the private sector. The blue bars show where uh, non-performing loan ratios stood at uh, in 2013. And the black dots, almost, in almost every case, which are higher than the blue bars, uh, show where things stood at uh, uh, as of the first quarter of uh, 2017. One piece of uh, good news, if it's really uh, implemented, is that you know when we look at uh, forward-looking uh, countries' fiscal consolidation plans and aggregate uh, By and large, uh, in most cases, uh, countries have uh, medium-term frameworks which show significant fiscal adjustment, which you know, gives you comfort in that you know, this adjustment is followed. It should allow debt levels to stabilize uh, at their current uh, levels. The problem in the past, of course, has been that fiscal adjustment tends to be delayed. Uh, so frequently, countries always put out adjustment one year ahead, one year ahead, and uh, uh, you know that cannot be uh, that cannot uh, continue uh, much longer. In particular, when we did a scenario where we said what would happen if fiscal deficits remained at the very elevated levels of the last several years, what it shows in almost every case uh, is. Uh, an exploding debt path, uh, most acutely so for the oil exporting countries, but even in the other uh, countries that uh, hopefully will be continuing to expand rapidly, it shows that debt levels continuing to increase uh, in the coming years, So, which would be, of course, uh, problematic. So a central message uh, and central requirement right now is for countries to uh, avoid any delays in uh, fiscal uh, adjustments. So with with uh, fiscal adjustment very much on the cards, uh, one of the things that we looked at very closely is to see what is the best way of doing adjustment. This is because adjustment can often uh, can often lead to uh, can have uh, adverse effects on outputs. Um, Yarek will talk. Yarek will talk a little bit more about this in detail in a little while. 
uh, we compared three forms of adjustment in sub-Saharan Africa to see which would be the least damaging, uh, the least, which would have the least effect on uh, Apple growth. Uh, we looked at uh, the impact of adjustment that focuses on uh, cutting spending, uh, cutting uh, consumption spend expenditure, and mobilizing revenues. And what these charts basically show is that uh, you know uh, adverse effects in aggregate in the region are lower than we've seen in advanced countries. Uh, and in particular, uh, adjustment that's focused on revenue mobilization, as shown in the far right chart, would have the least effect on outputs um, uh, going forward. And given that tax to GDP ratios in the in most countries remain uh, on the low side of the region, uh, unfortunately, we come back to focus on this when property prices uh, decline. But uh, you know, going forward, uh, given the volatility uh, that we've seen in commodity prices, it's once again very important to uh, know that and uh, you know, uh, focus policies on, on relying on a diverse set of uh, exports and activities to uh, engender growth. Uh, this chart basically shows the evolution of uh, the current diversification uh, across a broad range of sub-Saharan African countries. Now, typically, the story of our sub-Saharan Africa is that uh, it has been very limited in diversification. But when we have, and in aggregate, it, it, when you look at averages, that may be true, but there are actually pockets of excellence where countries have actually enjoyed significant uh, diversification. Uh, in this chart here, this is uh, depicted by uh, you know, the, the extent to which the black, large black dots are above the, above the black line that you see there. Two countries that stand out in particular, uh, I want to highlight are Botswana and um, Uganda, which over the years have seen uh, you know, significant uh, diversification in their, uh, in their uh, manufacturing, in their economic economies, uh, and export based. When we looked at what the factors behind uh, this diversification um, have been, it's a combination of uh, getting the policy mix appropriate, but also playing to your, to your strength. So, in Botswana, for example, you know, they built on the existing advantage that they have. They have, of course, a lot of diamonds uh, that they export. And what they did was basically to look for um, activities around the diamond uh, uh, sector to, to uh, move into next. Um, you know, so, it wouldn't make sense for a country like Botswana to, uh, to go into very labor-intensive uh, production processes or manufacturing processes. So, they played to the strength of the existing sector. Um, coupled with a very strong uh, governance over the years and prudent uh, macroeconomic policies. This has fostered the expansion of uh, diamond processing and uh, allied industries. In Uganda, more or less the same thing. Uh, Uganda is very much a, a, an agriculture-based economy with uh, many of the main exports being uh, agricultural commodities. Uh, in, in their case, uh, again, the diversification we've seen is around uh, agriculture, uh, increasing processing of, uh, of agricultural products, and also uh, other light manufacturing, particularly uh, production materials, um, uh, construction materials to neighboring countries, South Sudan, Rwanda, uh, DRC, um, emerging in recent years. Again, uh, there too, we've seen uh, the importance of a very stable macroeconomic environment over the years. Uh, and also the government's uh, very strong efforts to foster regional integration, particularly in the context of the EAC being very important factors that have facilitated uh, diversification. Bottom line on diversification is uh, important as it is, it really is, you know, how, what countries need to do has to be very country specific uh, and to play on the strengths that uh, countries already have. With that, uh, I'll finish my presentation. Thank you very much. And other stories, visit our website www.263chat.com. Follow us on Twitter at 263chat and like our Facebook page 263chat.